Hey, welcome back to uh, part four of Schizophrenia and Affective Disorders. This time we're talking about treatments for affective disorders. Okay, so the first thing we need to cover is the monoamine hypothesis. This is the idea that depression is caused by insufficient activity of monoamergic, monoaminergic neurons, right? We talked all about the monoamines way back in this class, so if you forget what those are, you can go back and refresh your memory. Um, so symptoms are not relieved by amphetamine or cocaine, which are potent dopamine agonists. Thus, it's most likely that we're looking at functionality related to um, norepinephrine and serotonin. An additional piece of evidence we know is that serotonin depletion and produces depressive symptoms. So that taking that all together, it paints a pretty strong case for serotonin being important. Unsurprisingly, there are several related treatments to monoamines. So, an early class of antidepressant was monoamine oxidase inhibitors, or MAOIs. These do exactly what they sound like. Monoamine oxidase is an enzyme that basically takes apart monoamines, prevents them from being used. So, if you uh, inhibit the action of this enzyme, it's going to increase the amount of monoamines that are available for signaling. So, it's going to increase the amount of serotonin and norepinephrine uh, that are available, right? We also have tricyclic antidepressants. These inhibit the reuptake of norepinephrine and serotonin, but they're not very selective, right? They also affect other neurotransmitters. So reuptake inhibitors, also a mechanism we've talked about in this class previously. One of the ways that uh, neurotransmitter signal is terminated is by reuptake, where the releasing neuron takes it back up into the cell. So if we prevent that process, we artificially increase the amount of that neurotransmitter that's available in the synapse and make it available for longer. So tricyclics do this, uh, but they're not very specific. By contrast, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors are much more selective, as the name implies, and are uh, much more zeroed in on increasing serotonin levels. There are also SNRIs, which work on both serotonin and norepinephrine. Which one works best for a given case is highly individual and oftentimes uh, multiple attempts at um, treatments will be undergone before a course is settled upon. But it doesn't seem to be the whole story, right? Just increasing neurotransmitter levels doesn't do it on its own. For example, SNRIs and SSRIs uh, increase serotonin and or norepinephrine activity very, very quickly, right? They start working in the sense that they increase levels of neurotransmitters almost immediately. However, patients often don't see relief of, from their symptoms for several weeks. This suggests that it's not a simple increase in the monoamine level activities that leads to relief. There's a number of things that can be going on here. Um, one suggestion is that increased monoamine activity starts a chain of events that produce changes to alleviate symptoms. Though it's not known exactly what that chain of events might be, there's a number of different ideas. So let's just take a look here to reacquaint all of you with how some of those mechanisms I mentioned are working. So uh, one way, that we mentioned that could, this could work, would drug would be an activating monoamine oxidase, right? Which is an enzyme that normally converts a neurotransmitter from its active form into some inactive metabolites. If we inactivate monoamine oxidase, that process happens less, which means more of the drug is available, or I'm sorry, more of the neurotransmitter is available. The other mechanism we mentioned was blocking reuptake. So if a transporter here that takes up the neurotransmitter and shoves it back into the cell, a drug like a tricyclic or SSRI is going to attach itself to this transporter and prevent that from happening. That is, of course, going to increase the amount of neurotransmitter available at the synapse and keep it out there for longer. So those treatments work for a lot of people, but some people are highly resistant to pharmacological intervention or talk therapy, and there are some uh, more unconventional methods that are still used for these treatment-resistant individuals. One of them is electroconvulsive therapy, or ECT. This is a brief electrical shock that causes a seizure. That might sound crazy or awful or something that we wouldn't do. You probably have a really horrific picture in your mind of what that might look like. But it's not really that way, right? These are control, done under controlled medical circumstances. Muscle relaxers are given to prevent the patient from injuring themselves. They're uh, anesthetized while this happens. And it doesn't cause pain. Um, what it does cause is a rapid decrease in depression symptoms. A few ECT um, induced seizures can alleviate severe depression in as little as a few days. Though it can be dangerous, prolonged or excessive use can cause brain damage. Typically this is used only in cases of people who are extremely treatment resistant and are in a really, really bad place. 
uh, or people who are in a bad place where we really just can't wait for them, uh, the antidepressants, to take their effect. So we can use this to produce a rapid reversal of symptoms while we wait for more conventional therapies to take hold. In addition to ECT, there's also ketamine therapy, which is something that's been sort of a hot area of uh, investigation lately. A single use of ketamine, which is uh, an MDA receptor antagonist that can cause dissociative or even psychotic-like symptoms. Uh, use of ketamine can produce rapid but often transient relief from symptoms. The mechanisms by which ketamine produces relief aren't really well understood, but they are certainly under investigation. Another method is deep brain stimulation. This is where indwelling electrodes are permanently installed in an individual. Uh, electrical stimulation can then reduce symptoms in some treatment-resistant persons uh, who show uh, little to no response to pharmacological, psychotherapy, or ECT approaches. So this is a way more drastic approach, right? It's very invasive. This is brain surgery, right? Invol installing indwelling electrodes. These can be placed in regions like uh, just below the anterior cingulate cortex, which we would call the subgenual ACC, uh, which is a region of the medial prefrontal cortex or within the nucleus accumbens. Uh, we see reduced symptoms in 50% of treatment-resistant patients using deep brain stimulation. By we, I of course mean the collective scientific we and not me personally, who has never or will never do this to a person. The pharmacological treatment for bipolar disorder is pretty interesting. It's lithium. So lithium is used to manage the manic phase of bipolar disorder. It does not produce flattened affect or impair intellectual processes, and 70-80% of bipolar patients respond well to lithium within about a week or two. What's really interesting about it is it does a lot of stuff. It produces a lot of physiological effects, and we're not really sure why it helps. We're just sure that it does. Uh, it is something that's under investigation, and there are a number of plausible mechanisms that have been proposed, but uh, there's no definitive answer as to why lithium helps. Um, this also requires people who are taking it for long periods of time to be subjected to frequent blood tests because this can affect uh, kidney and thyroid function. So one potential theory as to why SSRIs and drugs like it that increase monoamine activity produce relief is that they spark neurogenesis. So neurogenesis is the generation of new neurons, as the name would suggest. We talked about this previously, briefly. Uh, the idea that new neurons can develop throughout the human lifespan, though they only do so in two regions. One's the subgranular zone, which is mostly related to olfaction and is not really relevant here. And the other is the dentate gyrus of the hippocampus, which is important for learning and memory and certain kinds of emotionality. So that does fit. So what we do see in uh, animal studies is that stressful experiences produce uh, depression-like symptoms, suppress neurogenesis within the hippocampus, and it had a depressant. Uh, treatments increase neurogenesis within the hippocampus. And we can directly measure that in animals, right? We can see that neurogenesis is suppressed or increased as a result of stress and subsequent treatment. There's no way to measure neurogenesis in humans. We can measure brain volume and changes in brain volume, but we cannot measure new neurons being grown. It's just not something that we have the ability to see. However, we do see a correlation between increased neurogenesis and increased blood vo volume in the area in mice. So we know that neurogenesis is related to increased blood volume in mice. We also know that cardiovascular exercise in mice increases the blood volume in the dentate gyrus, measured by fMRI. Uh, then, after seeing that, we could do histological verification of that neurogenesis and see that those two things are related. In a somewhat similar vein, we know that blood volume increases in the dentate gyrus in humans following cardiovascular exercises. This suggests that it's at least possible that exercise could promote neurogenesis in humans. We know for certain that it promotes neurogenesis in mice, and that that change is correlated with an increase in blood volume in the dentate gyrus. We know that in humans, we see improvement in symptoms that would you know, suggest that this is helping, and we also see that increase in blood volume in the dentate gyrus. So, if you need more reasons to stay active, um, here's yet another reason, right? Promote neurogenesis in your hippocampus. So as we mentioned earlier, uh, some folks with depression experience disrupted sleep. So people with depression tend to experience decreased slow wave sleep and increased stage one sleep. Uh, their sleep experience is somewhat more fragmented. They awaken more frequently. Uh, they also tend to experience REM sleep earlier and spend a higher proportion of the first half of the night in REM. This is sort of like that REM rebound that we talked about. So you can see here uh, the disrupted sleep. So here's a normal subject compared to a depressed patient. Every arrow indicates uh, a waking epic. 
So you can see here, you know, even without looking very closely, the normal subject is moving through a sleep pattern in the way that it discussed, sort of from light sleep to heavy, up to REM, down to slow wave sleep, down to up to REM, then down to slower sleep, sort of throughout the night, spending more and more time in REM sleep as the night wears on, whereas the depressed patient is spending much more time in REM sleep very early and is showing this fragmented, disrupted sleep where they're never quite reaching slow wave sleep. So they're just not sleeping normally. And they're not feeling good or well rested. Okay, that's it for our discussion of the treatment of affective disorders. Next time we're on to anxiety disorders.